Welcome everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Deirdre Pickerel. I'm the Dean of Student Success for York Bay University and Toronto Film School. And on behalf of our whole student success team, I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's Ask an Expert session. As those of you know, if you are with us every Friday, each week at this time, we bring in an expert from the community on a wide range of topics, all focused on supporting our students during their studies and beyond. Our expert will offer some brief thoughts on the topic of the day, and then we'll take your questions, uh, which can be submitted through the Q&A option at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Today, I am absolutely thrilled to welcome Dr. Dave Redekop as uh, our expert today. A winner of provincial and national awards in career development. Uh, he's one of Canada's treasures in, in this field. Uh, Dave has devoted over 30 years to the development of better career development and workplace concepts and practices. His work has addressed a wide range of issues in both career development and leadership from developing models for strate strategic career development to creating innovative employee recruitment and selection approaches. He has worked with private sector, government, not-for-profit organizations across a wide range of industries. He's been privileged to be invited to work in almost every Canadian province and territory in a number of countries. Um, together with Michael Houston of Mount Royal University, Dave recently wrote a book on the relationships between career development and mental health called Strengthening Mental Health Through Effective Career Development, A Practitioner's Guide, and that's what he's here to talk to us about today. So, Dave, thank you so much for doing this, and over to you. Well, thanks very much, Deirdre. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm going to talk about career development and mental health. I'm going to just share my screen while, while I'm uh, explaining. And, and um, what I'm going to talk about was actually not initially intended for a sort of general audience. It was for career development practitioners. Mm. But, but um, we're going to try it out with you and we're going to see how it works. And um, I'm going to go very quickly because um, uh, Dr. Pickerel assures me you're the, the, the fastest um, academics in, in Canada. And so I'm going to go really quick. But I'm assuming you can have the slides afterwards, and, and I'll, I'll send them out. And uh, and we have a Q and A. So I really want to be done in you know less than 15 minutes, so we can actually address questions. So here's the deal: I'm going to talk about the connection between career development and mental health. And part of this is a sales pitch in the sense of selling to you the idea that you should look after your own career development and take that seriously, not just for economic reasons, cash flow reasons. Um, but for mental health reasons, and also so that you leave this session with one or two things you, you can actually do um, in, in terms of um, looking after your own mental health. And to start, I got to do some definitional things because we all understand career development differently. And a lot of us think of career development as, as well, choosing your next work or getting a job or, or, or thinking of a, a pathway. And, in Canada, we define it as this lifelong process of managing your learning, your work, your, your, your leisure, and, and the transitions in between those, right? And all in the service of moving towards some sort of preferred future that you have, some ideal that you want to aspire to. And the thing I want you to note in this definition is that work's only part of it. it the, the managing part is the way more important thing. And when you do career development and you take it seriously and intentionally and, and hopefully get some help with it, whether it's you know, online or through books or through a service, what you'll be working on is the managing part, uh, is you know, how to, how to self-reflect, how to uh, explore, how to make decisions, how to um, uh, look at options, those sorts of things. So there's one definitional thing. When I talk about career development, uh, I'm talking about all those things you need to do uh, to be able to manage your way toward a preferred future that involves more than just work. The other definitional thing that I'll be very quick about, but it, man, it was super helpful for me. It's been around for a long time, but um, it only kind of hit me like a ton of bricks when a colleague told me it needs to hit me like a ton of bricks like about three years ago. And that's Corey Key's model of mental health and mental illness being on two different continua. You know, m most, you know, our default notion in, in the mental health field and, and in the public is that we have mental health on one side, mental illness on the other, and you just kind of move from one to the other. And what, what Keyes is saying in this diagram is, no, you can, you can have 
high mental illness, low mental illness, and you can have high mental health, low mental health. And of course, the, as soon as you, know, you, you see this, you go, hang on, I know people who are really mentally healthy and have a mental illness. And in fact, because they're really mentally healthy, they're better able to cope with their illness. They're better able to hold off the symptoms of their illness, the onset, every once in a while. Like they can reduce that severity, they can reduce the frequency. So when I talk about mental health in this little chat, um, it, it's using this model. I'm not gonna mess with mental illness here, but in helping you look after your mental health, if you also have mental illness issues, it's your own mental health that will help you uh, better navigate and work around and, and cope with those mental illness issues is the Corey Keyes argument. There's lots of evidence, by the way, that he's right. Um, doesn't mean the other one's necessarily wrong, but, but it's an interesting way of looking at things. So um, here, here's, here's the sales pitch part, and uh, I'm going to go through this really quickly. So um, I got interested in, in career development and mental health um, a few years ago, and, and Michael Houston, my co-author, had been interested in a long time, but what got me interested in it was watching institutions and organizations and agencies and funders start having the conversation, boy, we really should pay attention to mental health, so maybe we should just cut career development services and use that money to, to go into mental health. And I thought, ooh, that's wrong on all sorts of levels and um, started really exploring how career development does contribute to mental health. And I'm obviously not gonna get into the details of this model here, but I just want you to think about if you engage in your own career development processes, you know, creating a vision for yourself, thinking strategically about your choices, self-reflecting on what's important to you, your values, your interests, your beliefs, um, always you know, keeping an eye out for opportunity, uh, being able to maneuver in your environment and, and, and meander around when you need to, all those sorts of things, which is all, you know, a, a, a whole lot of things actually around looking after your career development. These will lead to five sets of effects. And, and one of course is the obvious one, it's the one you, that initially motivates you to do it is life effects, right? You get work, you get income, you get a, an identity. But from a mental health point of view, what we have is all sorts of research that shows those life effects I just named also contribute significantly to mental health. People who work are almost always mentally healthier than people who don't, you know, unless the work is really exploitive and terrible and all those sorts of things. But if you're doing career development work, you're also learning skills for how to navigate your life. You're learning skills of, around career development. You're, you're learning a whole bunch of things that we're, we're going to call ability effects. The other thing we know about mental health, and, and, and there's no standard definition, by the way, of mental health. Um, there, there's these clusters. And one of the clusters that most people talk about is what's called environmental mastery. That, that part of mental health is being able to cope with what life throws at you. And career development processes actually are hugely helpful with that because they, they get you thinking about what life might throw at you before life throws it. And, and this is ridiculously helpful. The thing too, uh, as, as you um, go through career development work and you learn skills and, and, and things start to change for you, you start to see yourself differently. Your self-perception changes. And uh, practitioners see this all the time, but, but their, their, their clients don't necessarily always see it so obviously. But, but things like, just for example, being able to see that you can do stuff, right? Self-efficacy, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it is hugely important to mental health. Um, and that's different, by the way, than self-esteem, whether you feel good about that or not. It's actually less important than whether you think you can do stuff. Um, and and it, it's, it's that idea of self-efficacy and, and thinking, I can cope. Well, you stretch out, I can cope over time, over a long period of time into the future, and now you have hope, right? Now you go, hang on, I can cope now, I can cope tomorrow, I can cope next week, I can cope next month, I can cope next year. No matter what life throws at me, I can cope, that's hope. Hope is enormously important uh, to, to uh, several definitions of mental health. And hope is a little different than optimism, and that's where we get to opportunity perception effects. 
what you will find as you more strategically pursue and intentionally pursue your own career development is you start seeing the world differently. You start seeing opportunities differently. And all of you know this, right? If, if you know, you, you, you go to buy a car and, and you do all this shopping and you think, oh, I'm going to buy this car. And as soon as you drive it off the lot, this incredibly unique car that you designed and picked just for you, like 50 of them pass you. Right. And that's all you see all day long while you're driving in that car is that everybody owns that car. And you didn't see it until you had an, an intention around it. And I have a, a psychologist friend who has this great phrase, right? Intention creates attention. And so as we, as we shift our intention, which is what career development work helps us do, we start paying attention to different things. And one of, that, one of the outcomes of that is optimism. So where hope is seeing that uh, I'll be okay no matter what the future brings, optimism is, I think the future has actually got some opportunities for me. It's, it's going to be okay, right? And then uh, it, we have opportunity effects. And, and the evidence for this is, is um, um, le less certain. But the idea here is that when you start seeing the world differently, the world will see you differently. And you already know this, right? Like you already know that once you get, say, fired up about a subject in university um, and, and you start getting really interested in it and you ask, start asking interesting questions, guess what? Your, your, your classmates in that subject look at you differently. Your professors look at you differently. And that creates different opportunity, right? So you, you have people saying to you, hey, well, we're going to be talking about this. Do you want to join us? Who wouldn't have asked you prior, right? And now you have new opportunities, new opportunities for learning, for work, et cetera. That leads to life effects. So that was the sales pitch. Do career development. It's good for you. Um, but let's get to the more specific things you can do. And here is the thing that's common to all career development processes, or pretty much all career development processes, um, is they all help you control stress in some way, shape, or form. So I'll just give you a quick definition and then uh, we'll get to something practical for you. So stress is a reaction you have to perceptions about your ability to cope with something, right? So, you know, you, you see, oh, I got to go give, you know, a presentation in my class and, and you start thinking, oh, I wonder how well that's going to go. And so you have these reactions, right? And the, and the behavioral ones or the cognitive ones and, and the most obvious are the physiological, right? Heart rate goes up and your palms get sweaty and, and those sorts of things. And, and the thing to remember, and, and just knowing this is ridiculously helpful, is that that's what stress is. And so if you change your perceptions about coping, you, you change your stress immediately. And, and for those of you who are TED Talk types, uh, there's a gal named Kelly McGonigal who can show you how just how you view stress um, can actually immediately start changing whether it has health impacts on you or not. So if we agree that stress is a, a reaction to perceptions about coping, then what we need to do is look at, okay, so if I'm experiencing career related stress, um, uh, you know, the, the question, say, as a student or if, you're, if there's faculty listening in, um, the question is, am I experiencing career-related stress that presumably is excessive? Well, if no, then we're done and we're, we're fine. Because, And by the way, it's not like we want no stress, right? The absence of stress is death. Um, so we want a little bit, um, but we don't want it to be excessive and we don't want it to be um, uh, in, impairing our functioning. So let's say we say yes to this. Well, there's really only three ways of dealing with stress. And the first is to reduce demands, right? So, uh, and, and for those of you who are students, uh, man, you know how this goes, right? You, you go, I'm freaking out, I can't, I'm not gonna make it for this exam, I'm not gonna get this paper done, and you go chat to some, with somebody, and, and one of the first things they'll say is, well, drop the course. That'll solve your problem. And you know what, they're right. Right, that will reduce the demand. You don't have to show up for the exam if you drop the course. Now, the problem with that strategy is it leads to later stressors, right? It leads to demands that will come up later. So you might not want to do it. 
But you know what's super interesting is knowing that that's an option, just actually saying out loud to yourself, well, if I'm not ready, I'll drop the course, already reduces demands, right? It's the weirdest thing because it's changing your perception. It's changing your perception. You know, quick story, I was gonna drop out of university in my third year, Can't, uh, won't tell you why, long story. Um, and I went to see a counselor and everything went wrong in this counseling session and, and we actually had to leave the building, kind of how it went wrong. And uh, on the way out, she says, look, don't drop out today. If tomorrow's a bad day, come at the end of tomorrow and, and drop out then. And for the next nine years, yes, I was a student for 12 years um, until I got my PhD. Uh, for the next nine years, I woke up every morning and went, well, if this day sucks, I'm dropping out. And you know what? I, I had almost no days that sucked. Because now it's in my control. It, it's not something that's happening to me. Second option, increase your coping skills. Now, folks, this is huge. As much as I love the mental health movement, and I do, and I love that it's creating awareness and reducing stigma and that sort of thing, this is the piece that the North American, in fact, I would argue worldwide mental health movement is missing. And this is what career development people are really good at helping you with, is increasing your coping skills. So in a post-secondary, for example, the other option to, you know, freaking out about a test is actually learning how to study more effectively. And and there are ways of studying that are more effective than others. And, and, and there are people who know these ways and can teach you these ways. Now, I'm just saying this isn't going to work well at midnight before the test, right? But if you can start just getting a little bit ahead of the curve and start realizing, hang on, if I really learned how to study, if I really learned how to learn, then uh, uh, overall my career-related stress will go down. And I, I'm going to get into this a, a, a bit more um, in, the, in the next slide. But, but keep this thing in mind because um, the idea of learning how to deal with the demands um, tends to get overlooked in, if you go to you know, mental health websites and that sort of thing. What the mental health movement tends to look at is how to just manage stress as if you can't do anything about the, the demand, right? So, and, and this is all good stuff, right? You, you know, they'll tell you, get some sleep and eat well and, and you know, make sure you, you you have relationships in your life and and man all those things are fantastic but they don't drill deal with the actual stressor the the demand so let me show you then what happens right we've got these three options so reducing demands so i i, I let's say you're you're super indecisive about um you know a, a career decision well one of the ways to reduce the stress around that is to look around and find out that everybody's <laughs> indecisive about their career. Like it's just so normal. It's unbelievable. Yet we all think that everybody else knows what they're doing. They don't, they're lying if they do. Um, and so as soon as you know that your stress will go down, it's just a fascinating thing, right? So we get stress reduction when we reduce demands. And I'm going to go to the far right where it says manage stress. So you do things like yoga and mindfulness and exercise and all that. And please do all those things. They will reduce your stress. No doubt about it. And that's great. But if you look in the middle, what coping skills do for you, say, for example, getting good at career development stuff, like making decisions and, and exploring and, 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 and talking to people about their work, those things will get you stress reduction because you'll start feeling better about your career development and how you can cope. But it will also create a number of other outcomes, right? You'll become more skilled. You'll have long-term coping skills um, that, that aren't just, you know, like you can exercise today, but two days from now, it really has no bearing, right? But, you know, long-term coping does, right? Um, you'll be more likely to stay in school and be, or, or, or work if that's what you're doing et cetera, et cetera. And, and I won't get into all of these. Um, and, and there's research around all of these things. So the thing about coping skills is if you work on those, you, you actually get a double whammy. You get stress reduction and you get something that will carry you forward. So uh, I'll just give you an example. Um, 
that, that's pretty immediate in the COVID world, right? All of us had to go home and all of us had to figure out how do we do our work from home? Well, this creates some stress. And so, um, you know, all of us went and exercised more and, and all that sort of stuff, which was great. We couldn't reduce the demands. We had to get the work done. In fact, the, the demands were up. Now we all had to learn Zoom and that sort of thing. And you know what's interesting is the people, people are learning Zoom, people are learning all these things who've had years to figure this out and have resisted it, but now they're learning it. And now, of course, it's not stressful. They're kind of liking it. They kind of don't want to go back to the office. Um, and so if we can just all talk to ourselves a bit about, I know I don't want to do X, but I also know, you know, all I have to do is learn how to do it and it won't be as painful. And, and I'll, my stress will go down, right? Uh, it sounds ridiculously simple. And in fact, it, it will sound so simple that you might be going, well, uh, duh, you know, this is obvious. But don't let the uh, duh moment stop you from actually doing it, right? Um, it's, it's really important. There, there will be parts of being a student. There will be parts of being a worker that uh, will create stress where actually just getting better at it will help you. One last example, I teach the, or I have taught the police over the years a lot, like thousands. And one of the things I, I do just to rile them up is, is tell them I could reduce crime in Canada by 10 to 20% in, in three months, and I could, by the way, um, by issuing Mavis Beacon Teaches Typing. You know, it's a software program created in the 80s, I think. And teach these people how to type, because they're all doing it with their, you know, like their fingers like this. And ask any police officer anywhere in Canada how much time they spend typing, and they'll say more than 50% on their computer. But if they got better at typing, they'd hate it less, and they could actually go do policing, right? And that would actually help them out, right? That becomes a career development thing. That's why they got into policing. It wasn't to type, right? It was, it was to go solve problems. Anyway, I don't want to go on. That is... That, there's my spiel. So All right, I, started, I started talking, but I had muted myself, so oh, oh. <laughs> not helpful. <laughs> that was, I have like a page and a half of notes, and I've, I've heard you talk before. So I, <laughs> every time I, um, you know, something comes up, something new comes up. Um, but one of the things I really liked, Dave, was this notion of intention creates attention. And that, that kind of sums up our work in career development so beautifully. If you mm. start paying it, you know, if you start it being intentional around it, then it creates this, you know, we're, then we're really, we're, we're much more, we're paying attention more to careers and that kind of just creates this lovely cycle um, where we're starting to take ownership. So that's beautiful. So um, we've had a question come in and um, I, I think that uh, this question is, is probably something that a lot of students um, and a, a lot of anybody really, but a lot of students are probably struggling with. But what advice would you give someone who is trying to cope with stress and my own well-being, but being surrounded by negative people? So a parent, spouse, you know, all of those people that, that are just have not only negative energy, but negative words. Um, and it, it can be a daily struggle where, where, you know, there's just physical, mental, and emotionally exhausted. What kind of what kind of strategies would you recommend? Well, see, that's an interesting one, right? Because like, you've got options there, right? You can reduce demands, right? It's just, you know, close your door, don't talk to them, you know, those sorts of things, right? But, but it's not very helpful in the long run, is it, to reduce those demands? Or you can go on the other side of that equation and just, you know, go for a run every time somebody's negative. But that gets to be time consuming and it still doesn't help the, the person change. And so, you know, with that one, going down the middle is actually the, the only really productive way to go, which is, is to think about how could I learn skills that would actually help me interact with these people in such a way that I can maintain a relationship because I want to, you know, and, or I'm stuck with them, so I might as well, and, and um, learn skills for changing the, the, the tone of the conversation, the tone of the topic. And, and the, I mean, this is the great thing about the internet, right? Is there is stuff out there on this, right? Where you can, you, can, you can learn how to deal with negative people. You can learn how to deal with negative thoughts. You can learn how to bring those people along gradually um, so that they're, they're less negative. 
you can learn how to, for example, confront and just say, hey, you know, our, our last five conversations uh, have all spiraled downward and I, I'd really like to avoid that. Like there, these are skill sets that, that actually can be, can be learned. Most of us don't want to ex execute these skill sets, right? So we put them off and we do like, I'm, you know, I'm a supportive personality, right? Hate conflict. So, you know, my thing is reduce demand. I just stick my head in the sand. But, you know, when I pull my head out, guess what? They're still there. And so, you know, over the years, I've had to figure out, man, I should have just learned how to deal with this stuff and, and kind of uh, yeah, learn the skills earlier and, and use them to, you know, really use them. Now, I know that sounds, again, sort of on the ridiculously obvious side, but that is the way to go here. Yeah, that's great. We had a similar question come in, um, Dave, around, you know, and I, I surrounded by negativity and, you know, we're just, just the world and people seem mean. And so I think those, um, you know, those tips in terms of, you know, yeah, we could just block all of those people out of our lives, which some people choose to do. They choose to say, yeah. you know, I, I can no longer, you know, have you in my life. Obviously it's hard when it's parents. Um, but then some people also, you know, look to get support to how do I, how do I engage these people in, in a more meaningful conversation so that at least I feel like I have a voice. Maybe they're not going to change, but I can at least stand up for, you know, for my needs. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, a question here that I think comes up a lot around uh, around work and life that, you know, we, we do have people that we, in our lives that we, we really like, but we they're, they're those, you know, kind of type A's, go, 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 always, always working, very, very, very driven to succeed. So what are some strategies for actually finding some balance? Because, you know, that, that drive can be successful in a career, but at some point I, I would wonder if it's going to impact mental health. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting thing and it gets back to me to part of the definition of career, right? So if we see um, kind of that, that career side as this very work-oriented, it's separate from everything else in life, then, then you can see these type A's, right, going for that. <clears throat> and, and they're hoping that that will ultimately lead to, you know, a, a better life because it's all wrapped up in the, in the their, their career aspirations and rethinking career and, and helping, <clears throat> you know, type A's really kind of look at, so what is it I actually want out of life and be type A about that, not just about work. You get some interesting things. I mean, imagine somebody who's type A about their relationships, about being a good neighbor, about um, being a really good leisureite. Um, you know, about being a worker as well. And, and they, they start um, focusing uh, or removing the focus just from work and, and they, they, they spread it out. And what's interesting is, you know, we all know people like this, man, they're fantastic people to know, right? Because whatever they get into, they, they do it well. They just need to be reminded sometimes, I think that, that there is that more to life than just work. And, and this is where good career development uh, helps people put that all together so they can actually see that, right? That they can see and feel that connection to hang on, I'm not just working for the sake of working. I'm, I, I, got a, I got an intention, a vision, a future that I'm moving towards that's much bigger than work. And in fact, may at some point not involve work. Yeah, that's, that's great. I'm getting conscious of time, but holy smokes, not a surprise for me. I knew you'd be popular and the questions are just coming in fast and furious. So I will apologize to everybody right now. We're not going to get to everyone. It's just, it's just not going to be possible. Um, so there, there's, there's so many questions that I think would be really critically important, Dave, but I'm just Um, what are some ways to kind of get started? What are some of those initial, um, you know, steps that people should be taking to, to start to really build their future career plans and, and being more intentional around, around developing their careers? Oh, okay. Well, I mean, again, I'm, I'm going to go to the obvious, but yeah. figure out what, how you like working, right? You know, are you a, a, a book person, an internet person, a person person? Um, and because and, there's endless resources out there uh, 
in in all all forms for career development help that that doesn't need to cost anything or or, or very much and so you know like there, there's some great books out there on uh, uh, you know there's that design your life one that's been extremely popular that came came out a couple of years ago um, you go to any self-help thing and there's lots of um, you know books on career development and it, there's no right model it's just about being intentional right so you just start thinking about it and you, you'll start thinking about what you need to do next second thing though is that there, there are some great websites and um, the one that is weirdly um, comprehensive is Alberta's and I don't yeah. say that just because I'm in Alberta it is one of the most comprehensive sites on earth and it's called Alice A L I S uh, dot Alberta dot C A. Go there because it will lead you everywhere else. It will lead you to live services, of whether you know potentially in your province too. Um, but also go to your provincial websites wherever you are. Um, there are career development associations in every province that have information, and every province, you know, its employment department or labor department will have. Uh, pointers to who you can talk to, where you can go, those sorts of things. Um, yeah, and I would just get started, uh, just get started. Like it really doesn't matter. Even talk to your neighbor about, you know, so how do you make career decisions and how did you get to where you are it can be enormously helpful because you'll start thinking about how that applies to you. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That in, uh, that brings up that quote again, I think intention creates attention, yeah. right? If you, we, we always used to talk about that with building your network and things like that. Talk, talk to all of the people in your, in, the, in your network, your hairdresser, your soccer coach, all of those, your neighbor, all of those people about, you know, how, how did they manage their career? How did they make their career decisions? All of, all of those sorts of things. Everyone, I'm so sorry that it is like now 932 or 1232, depending on where you are, 1032 for Dave, and we've, we've run out of time. I, like these, in some cases, these 30 minutes are just not enough. Yeah. So um, I just want to remind everybody that, you know, we do, there's so many questions we just could not get to. Um, but please remember that Yorkville University does have a career services uh, department. So career services at yorkvilleuniversity.ca, Toronto Film School students, you are more than welcome to access that as well. We just don't want to have multiple emails. The Learning Success Center, when it launches, will have career services, uh, a load of information. I'm writing all of the stuff as fast as I possibly can because um, career development is my background, actually. Catherine Bonney, our career advisor, has office hours drop in uh, twice a week. So please do not hesitate to connect. You've, you've all answered some really valuable questions uh, here in the chat. And it's, it's just, I, we just do not have time to answer them. So um, on that note, um, definitely reach out because your questions are important and we do want to get you the support. But in the meantime, Dave, thank you so much for doing this. We might have to have you back. Like this was... Uh, this was, fun. was fantastic and such an important topic, especially now with, you know, there's so much, you know, even if the only thing that's changed is somebody's now working from home <laughs> and trying to do school and, you know, their partner's working from home and their kids are from home, like that has, has just created an incredible amount of stress. So, you yeah. know, in addition to the people that have obviously lost their jobs through COVID, which is tragic, you know, and all of the repercussions, not only on, on their lives in terms of finances and food and, you know, some of those real basics, but in terms of their own mental health. You know, we also have people that are, you know, very thankful to be working, but man alive, it hasn't made life much easier. So, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah that's for sure. Right. So um, thank you very much, everyone. We will hopefully see you all back next week. And Dave, I am forever grateful. Thank you very much for doing this. Really, really Thanks. appreciate it. You take good care. You too. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Remember to be kind and be safe.